Our next speaker is Steve Omohundro, uh, who will be speaking on AI, deception, and blockchains. Uh, Steve founded Possibility Research and Self-Aware Systems to develop beneficial intelligent technologies. He has degrees in physics and mathematics from Stanford and a PhD in physics from Berkeley. He's done internationally recognized work on AI safety and strategies for its beneficial development. He's on the advisory board of AI Startups, AI Brain, and Cognitalk, and is past chairman of the Silicon Valley ACM Special Interest Group in AI. Please welcome Steve. <clears throat> so thank you all for being here. Uh, we're going to talk about AI deception and blockchains and sort of the slightly larger context is to what extent are we faking our lives these days? So talking about faking, the term fake news suddenly had a spurt of interest in the uh, end of 2016 for some reason. And uh, it later came out that there were these Macedonian teenagers who were generating these fake news stories and they were making money on people clicking on them, getting advertising revenue. And they were making hundreds of thousands of dollars and uh, th this is sort of a shocking thing. And more recently, uh, a massive study has come out analyzing what, were th what was the impact of all this fake news. How did it spread? Where did it go? And the final conclusion was essentially that it, the fake news moved faster, deeper, and further than the real news. And this is sort of uh, the Mark Twain quote, a lie can get halfway around the world before the truth even gets its boots on. <clears throat> Ironically, Mark Twain never said this. <laughs> but still true. <laughs> so why is fake news more able to spread than real news? Well, for one thing, if you're not you know, bound by the truth, you can you know, make news that's much more interesting. So a fake content can be more exciting than real content. <clears throat> and there's a lot of study of memetics these days. And one of the discoveries is that multiple memes which oppose one another can actually cause each other to spread. And so that is uh, a source of, of the fast dynamics of fake news. <clears throat> so, wonderful new book by Robert Lustig, looking at a lot of the ills of modern society, including the very high sugar food we eat, the uh, drugs like uh, ADHD drugs that kids are taking, uh, our sort of addictive screen content that's aimed at getting us to click and to retweet. And what he discovers is that all of these behaviors are driven by dopamine, same thing that drives uh, gambling behavior and pornography, and that dopamine is sort of a neurotransmitter that represents desire, the sense that something you're seeking, you're about to get, you get a little shot of dopamine. And so a lot of these uh, real advertising and fake news are trying to stimulate that sense that you're about to discover something surprising or amazing that you really want. On the other hand, serotonin is what's behind happiness. And in this book, he describes the dynamics where dopamine is addictive, and uh, as you get more and more shots of dopamine, you actually downregulate the dopamine receptors, and so it means you need more to get the same feeling. And it's sort of antagonistic to serotonin. And so your long-term happiness is actually decreased. And so this kind of uh, phenomena, the food we eat, the screen behaviors that we're engaged in, are lowering our overall happiness, increasing addiction, and increasing depression. <clears throat> it's cr also creating a sort of a fake world where the, the stories that you click on are typically negative ones, ones that indicate some apocalypse is about to happen or some terrible, scary thing, and it tends to create a world view that uh, the world is full of conflict, it's scary, it's low trust, there's very little love and lots of scarcity. All of those things cause you to sort of behave in this addictive manner. Whereas the reality is, by many objective measures, 2017 was the best year in human history. We had, we had the smallest proportion of people who were hungry, impoverished, illiterate, smallest proportion of child mortality in all of human history, more people with electricity and clean water than ever before in history. So all of that was about, most of the fake news we've had to deal with so far has been about text. Somebody wrote a story that wasn't true. Um, ever since the development of the photograph, various groups, politicians especially, 
have loved the idea of being able to alter photographs. Because if you can alter photograph, you alter history. And Stalin was famous for this. Whenever somebody fell out of favor with Stalin, he would have their photograph removed. <laughs> this is a particularly funny case because the original photograph had four guys, and then gradually they fell out of favor, and it finally ended up with just Stalin. <laughs> the US did this as well. Here's a very famous photograph of Abraham Lincoln, but it turns out it's not actually Abraham Lincoln. It's just his head uh, stuck on John Calhoun's body. So the technology for doing this back at that time required a fair amount of artistry. Uh, work in the, in the dark room, sometimes with paintbrushes, artists, and so on. These days, uh, to modify photographs, we use Photoshop quite a bit. In fact, the word shopping, oh, has that image been shopped, has become quite a common and popular thing. The, the tool in Photoshop that makes this most uh, easy to do is something called the clone tool, which lets you take textures from one part of an image and put, put them on another part. Makes it easy to remove things, and uh, it's fairly easy to detect that an image has been Photoshopped, and there are several tools available on the internet. There's sort of an arms race between the ability to fake images and the ability to detect that they've been faked. Until recently, it hasn't been very easy to generate new faces or images that are realistic. They tend to, to look something like this, where they're kind of face-like, but there's something off about them. And in fact, in the 1970s, Masahiro Mori invented the term uncanny valley, where as a depiction of a human-like face gets closer and closer to reality, there's a sort of a creepiness factor that comes in. And if you're in the uncanny valley, it, doesn't, it looks fairly real, but there's something off about it. And so, you've, and so movies have had to struggle in trying to create animated characters that, that cross the uncanny valley. And I would say, oh, maybe five or six years ago, uh, they started being successful at this. Digital Emily is an example where most people can't tell that that's a completely synthesized face. Most recently, uh, the field of AI has been revolutionized by something called deep neural nets. And there's a particular variant called GANs, or Generative Adversarial Networks, which have been able to generate very, very realistic images and also transfer traits from one set of images to another one. Here's an example of taking a horse and turning it into a zebra. Uh, it's not exactly perfect, but it's pretty darn good and it's getting better every day. All of these faces are generated by GANs. None of them are real. If you look carefully, you can see some little artifacts, but these networks are getting better and better at that. So the ability to generate completely artificial characters, and in fact, a completely artificial reality, is becoming uh, off the shelf. A few months ago, there was an extreme version of this. Somebody created something called the Deep Fake Network, put it on the web for free, and it, what it allows you to do is train on a set of videos of one character, take their face, and insert it into a video of another character in a seamless way where you can't tell that it's not them. So in this case, this video is of Gal Gadot, the, the actress who played uh, Wonder Woman. And some teenage boys have inserted her face onto the body of a porn star. And in fact, there was a whole Reddit group called Deep Fakes where it became a whole industry of putting celebrities' faces on, in other uh, situations in a way that's pretty seamless. You can't tell that that's not her. And uh, another uh, sort of trend was Nicolas Cage, putting Nicolas Cage's face into every movie. So Nicolas Cage became James Bond. Nicolas Cage you know, went after the uh, Raiders of the Lost Ark, and uh, sort of funny. But it's sort of very controversial, is this? Uh, you know, harming that actress? How do you stop it? Reddit closed that group down, uh, but there's still quite a bit on the internet if you look. And it's freely available to anybody that just wants to download the software. Adobe started using this technology. Adobe was behind Photoshop. Uh, they started applying it to their video technology as well. Here's an example of Adobe Cloak, where the original video has a pole that goes in front of the, uh, the image and it can delete that seamlessly in a way that you can't tell it was ever there. Um, they're starting to apply it to speech. Adobe has something called uh, audio software that's sort of the 
audio equivalent of Photoshop. <clears throat> and from 60 seconds of someone's speech, you can generate them saying anything. So you can no longer believe something just because it sounds like a particular person saying something. There's a startup company called Liarbird, which has a similar product. And uh, here's a demo that was done by a group at Stanford, where in real time, you speak in front of a camera, and it generates, in this case, Donald Trump saying whatever you're saying. And so imagine that they said, we're dropping the bomb tomorrow, or something like that. You could start an international incident uh, based on fake generated video. So uh, the art world has had to deal with this issue for a long time, the issue of forgeries. Uh, there was a very unique and interesting case a few months ago that this uh, Salvatore Mundi is claimed to be a Leonardo da Vinci painting, and it sold for $450 million, though there's a lot of question people have as to what its authenticity is. This is what the painting looked like in the 1950s, and this is what it looks like today. Seems like there's been a fair amount of restoration that maybe altered things a bit. And uh, in fact, some uh, art critics are not believing that it's a real painting. So how do you know, and $450 million, what's the story behind that? So the art world um, is starting to use artificial intelligence to help detect if paintings are real or not. And here's a program that looks at the brush strokes in a painting, and it compares it with the brush strokes in other paintings by that artist, and tries to see if it's real or not. Uh, in general, we're in an arms race between those who would deceive, create deceptive media, and those who would detect that that media is deceptive. Uh, in the cryptographic world, there's theory about the generation of cryptographic hash functions, where you're trying to generate bits that look like they're random, but they're actually not. But the cost of determining that they're not random is way higher than generating them. And so in that case, it looks like the fraud generators will beat the fraud detectors. I think that's probably going to be the case in uh, media as well. So what the art world does is it says it's not just the painting that determines whether it's a real or a value, valuable art. Uh, there's also something they call provenance which is, what is the history of that painting? Where did it start? Who owned it? And what's the trail all the way from its beginning to, to, to today? And if you have good provenance, that makes a painting much more valuable. So I believe what we need is a digital version of provenance, something that tracks not only the bits of the, of the item, but also its history. So how do we do that? So two new technologies have arisen in the last 10 years or so called blockchains. The first was Bitcoin, invented by the pseudonymous Satoshi Nakamoto. Nobody knows who that is. In 2008, and it allowed people who don't know one another and don't trust one another to transfer value in these coins called Bitcoin. But more than that, the blockchain in which it's based allows information to be stored in a way that cannot be easily deleted. And so that gives a kind of record or history that could be used for provenance. And more modern Bitcoins or blockchains, such as Ethereum, which was introduced in 2015, uh, make that much more explicit and allow for something called smart contracts or programs that run on the blockchain. And lots of groups are now using it explicitly for uh, keeping records and ledgers that can't be easily altered. And so for an example, let's say we're going to take a photograph we would like to know that that photograph was taken at a certain moment in time and has not been altered since then. How might you do that? Well, on the blockchain, the top block on the blockchain uh, is something that depends on all the previous history. So it's very hard to fake. And so you could take the top blockchain, combine that with the, uh, a record or a summary of an image, and then put that back on the blockchain. And that gives you very good guarantees that this image was taken sometime between those two times and has not been changed since then. Similarly, for location, many cameras now have uh, GPS uh, detectors in them. And so they can, you can record the location. And there are various proof of location techniques that uh, blockchain groups are creating based on the timing of pings between different nodes in the network that allow you to give a very good guarantee of an item happening at a, a given location. So we can potentially get both time and space 
uh, in this permanent record that gives us a sort of provenance for digital media. I believe politicians should be wearing body cams, just like police officers do, so that we can track and record and know exactly what they're, that they're doing what they say they're doing. After all, they're servants for us. <coughs> and in general, there are a whole bunch of new ideas based on this kind of permanent record, which enable us to have more confidence and truth in what's actually going on in the world. We can have verified audio, images, video, uh, both in time and space. Uh, potentially reputation-based measures of how true news is, uncensorable speech, techniques for verifying uh, voting, politician accountability, uh, and some new ideas people are exploring, something called liquid democracy, something called futarchy, and something a more extreme version called the backseat economy. All of these explorations allow us to take back the notion of what is real, what is true in our world, and uh, avoid slipping into a uh, dark and negative uh, fake reality. Thank you. Time for questions? Go ahead. Is what you've told us going to destroy the judicial system, or is there going to be some way that we can really differentiate real evidence from false evidence? It's a really good question. Um, we're in this sort of intermediate period now where our ability to fake stuff, I think, is better than people realize. And so we're vulnerable right now to uh, having the judicial system being fooled. But very quickly, people are going to realize, oh, wow, it's pretty easy to get any, anybody saying anything. And so evidence is going to be, until, until we have a reliable system for the provenance of evidence, uh, just because you have a recording of somebody or a video of somebody, that's going to be meaningless. So the explanations that you gave here um, make a lot of sense for a news organization, how they might verify um, what's real and what's not. But I think a lot of what we've seen recently has been fake news that's passed from person to person through social media. So how do you imagine that blockchain could maybe be integrated into something where an everyday person can verify whether something is uh, real or not without having sort of a, an investigative portion to that? Yeah, I think that's a really interesting question. I think new norms are going to emerge, especially as fake stuff gets, m fake videos, fake audio becomes more omnipresent. People are going to start demanding some kind of verification. You know, Twitter has a blue check mark that verifies you're the real person. Maybe there'll be something like that. Oh, this is verified, you know, unaltered media based on this technology or something like that. Yeah, uh, people are already working on things that are sort of like spam filters that would do the same sort of thing. So you could hook them up to your feed and you could look at a particular video and they would determine that this video or this audio is likely to be false. But as you say, the really good fraud people are a little bit ahead of that, but people are working on that. Yeah, thank you. Question in the front. Yeah, we know the normal swearing and you know procedure for you know giving testimony is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. I can see how this could work on the truth and nothing but the truth. But is there some way you could guarantee that something isn't left out in a statement? Yeah, that's a, sort of the the dog that didn't bark kind of thing. Um, you know, as more and more people have cameras and big events more and more people are recording it. And so it becomes more likely that somebody recorded something. So I think, um, like it or not, the cameras are gonna become ever more omnipresent. And so that's gonna make uh, having holes in our, our recorded representation of reality less likely. So a very interesting idea. I guess the question is who's working on it or what are the next steps? Because it sounds like, you know, you'd almost need this built into your camera, so it's recording this over time and adding that to the blockchain. So who's doing the work on it? You know, there are a whole bunch of little groups. The blockchain world is a crazy wild west right now. And so there, anything you can think of, there's probably somebody working on it. Uh, and there are a number not saying, not doing exactly the things I mentioned, but quite close. In the back. This. 
Yes, I read that South Korea has developed a robot that has 62 facial expressions and ha is a citizen now of Saudi Arabia. <laughs> and wanted you to comment on that. Sophia, yes. Uh, and she's, uh, um, that's more of a PR stunt than I think something really serious. <laughs> but on the other hand, it's quite interesting. And the fact that Saudi Arabia would accept that says something about where Saudi Arabia sees it's going itself going. You know, they realize that the oil is only going to last a little bit longer. They're creating a city, a high-tech city called Neom, which uh, they want to be the AI center for the world. And I think uh, that step of giving Sophia citizenship was a sort of symbolic gesture in that direction. Hi. Uh, is there a way uh, for counterfeiting? There are uh, physical devices that kind of track counterfeiting stuff like RFIDs, et cetera. Is there a way, do you think, in the future of combining blockchains with physical aspects? Yeah, I think that's a really interesting issue. You know, the, the counterfeit physical objects is a huge, huge issue these days, too. You know, you can buy a beautiful coach handbag for $1,200, but you go around the corner and some guy else sell it to you for $4. And how do you know? Is it real? Is it not? Uh, turns out a lot of uh, the uh, olive oil on our shelves is not olive oil. Uh, similarly, a lot of the supposed uh, tuna in sushi is not really tuna. So we've got a big physical object counterfeiting issue as well. And uh, there are people thinking about it. And the potential for using blockchain-like ideas in that arena is quite interesting. Yeah? Uh, I have a question. What, what about the computational cost? I mean, you hear of Bitcoin you know, eating up all this... Uh, resources just to mine the coins, what, you know, how could you have a blockchain record for everything, every photograph that someone takes of their little baby? Yeah. Blockchain, uh, Bitcoin per se is actually very inefficient and its structure, part of how it gets its integrity is it's on, on, on route to burning up all the electricity of the world. <laughs> um, there are a number of alternatives. One group I'm involved in is called Definity, which thinks it has a better way of doing that. And I'm sure we're going to see much improved alternatives over what's available today. Yes. Hey, Steve. Great talk. Hey. Um, let's see. Uh, would the low-hanging fruit be biometric identification and getting rid of anonymous trolls so that you, you need to sign in and your comments need to be uh, a true name? Yeah, I think anonymity is really toast. That, uh, well, first of all, it's not even really going to be possible. When there are cameras everywhere, uh, the idea that you are somehow anonymous online is not going to be, not going to hold. And I don't, I don't think it brings out the best of humanity, especially in for discussion forums. So I totally agree that uh, having true names is probably going to be the social norm of the future. Uh, although, although the other piece of it that I wor worry about, uh, not so much in the United States until November 2016, but uh, China, North Korea, totalitarian regimes, uh, there's the, the opposite problem of needing to be anonymous uh, in order to criticize the government and problems with that. It's going to be a real shift. Uh, China is just about to introduce their social credit system in 2020 where you are rated on uh, what actions you take online and in the physical world. And uh, your access to resources depends on how high your credit rating is. And so it's going to be a fascinating experiment to watch. Uh, it, many in the West feel a little bit scared and chilled by that. Others say, hey, it's a great way to sort of get everybody working toward the social good. Hi. Um, so uh, it seems like a lot of these defensive technologies are kind of on the cutting edge, whereas our education system, as always, <laughs> lags severely behind. And so our youth is being trained to process information according to these old standards that are outdated. Um, do you feel, based on your experience, that that's being addressed somehow? You know, I think there are a lot of school systems that are starting to incorporate computer science uh, and actually artificial intelligence and some of those technologies. Um, I think the kids are probably ahead of the school system. Uh, most kids are exploring those topics on their own a lot more than the school system is. What an appropriate curriculum is for the coming few decades, I think nobody really has a good clue. But it's clearly, probably the current one is really not so helpful. Yeah. 
Hi, um, I was wondering if you have any thoughts on the implications of this technology on the lives of people who do not have access, the half of the world's population that does not have access to internet on a regular basis or some of these technologies? Yeah, you know, what's interesting is the cost of this technology is dropping so rapidly that my, my intuitive sense that that won't last much longer, that um, I think there was a group in India that was making an Android smartphone for $3 that um, was almost as powerful as, it was, it was like a, a, an Apple iPhone 1. And so once it gets down in that range uh, and solar power becomes more easily available, I think we're going to see an entirely wired world, for better or worse, uh, very, very soon. And, uh, but I think it's a very important and interesting issue. Yeah. Yeah, hi. Uh, to speak again to the computational cost and also the ability to verify, how would you know if I've got something that on my server side I have validated and now I'm going to push it out to people, how do they know if this has been upsampled, downsampled, all of which would be completely legitimate or it's some potentially valid subset? So that's going to be a different SHA-512 or whatever it is you're going to hash it with. So the easiest thing is just direct hash of the raw data that this has not been altered since it's original. If you want to start allowing some kinds of modifications, you need a protocol which would allow uh, the, the end user to compare uh, the hash uh, or have a certain specially designed perceptually uh, hash functions that, that allow that kind of transformation. So a, I think there's a range of possibilities there uh, which could be quite valuable and useful. Thanks. Okay, um, that's all the time we have for questions. Thank you very much, Steve. Thank you.